We're coming to the conclusion of our study of Song of Solomon. We're calling this lesson, His Bride Has Made Herself Ready. This is the sixth and final song in the Song of Solomon. We're going to take our text from the eighth chapter, beginning with verse 6, going down through verse 16, 14, excuse me. This is the sixth and final song. In, in the first song, you find it tells the story of how they first met in northern Israel. There is actually three pictures in that, three pictures that she draws out and tells about that early time. In the second song, this is the time of their courtship, and there's two pictures that she shows us here. The time of their courtship there in northern Israel when he was coming to visit her, at her home. The third song tells about their wedding. It, it begins in chapter 3. It ends up at the first of chapter 5. It tells about the wedding and the honeymoon, their experiences together. In the fourth song, it begins in chapter 5 talking about some difficulties that they ran into in their marriage. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened. It was just one of those marital problems that had to be worked out between this young couple that had gotten married and now as king and queen, they were having to learn how to live with each other. The fifth song begins with the story of how they decided we're not going to allow our problems to destroy our relationship. And so they start about a process of restoration, reconciliation. And so the fifth song deals with that, how that they are restored again in their relationship. And then finally, we come to this sixth song. The sixth song is observations about what they have learned in their love relationship. Let's, let's examine it and see what we find. First, I note that the song begins back in chapter 1 and verse 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That's the kiss of intimacy, the cry for intimacy. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That cry has been fulfilled. And two have become one flesh. And so... This is the story of what they have learned in their love relationship as they've walked together for these several years. We don't know exactly how many years, but obviously they're not a young couple anymore. The first part of this lesson is what I'm going to call the call of love. The call of love. You find in chapter 8 and verse 5, he says, I awaken you under the apple tree. Now, I personally believe what he's speaking of there is love, love, love. I awakened you under the apple tree. In the previous verse, he's been talking about don't awaken love too early. Now he's saying, I awakened you under the apple tree. So I believe what he's referring to there is about love. This is where their love first began to awaken in their hearts. They had met each other there in northern Israel. And this, this, this sixth song gives us some more glimpses into that. But uh, as a shepherd girl growing up in the mountains of northern Israel, she was a country girl. So she knew about apple trees. She knew about sheep. She understood about the farm life. And it was there where they had first met at her home, where they first discovered their love for each other. Now they have returned back again on their second honeymoon. They've come back again to celebrate their love relationship. And so as they are there, she makes this statement in verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Now, we think of a seal as something that, you know, is just sealing the envelope or, you know, sticking it together. But a seal to them was much more than that. The seal actually was a mark of ownership. That's what it was. And so they would place their seal upon it. That meant this belongs to me. 
So when she said, set me as a seal upon your heart and upon your arm, what she's saying is, I want everybody to know that I belong to you, that I am yours. Now, it's a beautiful, poetic way of expressing their love relationship. The second part of the lesson, I want to focus on what I'm going to call characteristics of love. It is here that they begin to define what love is like, what love is. Now, this is one of those key phrases in Song of Solomon because it's really the purpose of the book. This is why it was written, to give us a definition of what love is really like. Let's examine it together. The first statement is, for love is as strong as death. Boy, that, that's a powerful statement. Love is as strong as death. In other words, love will never give up in its pursuit of you. If you truly love, this is why in the book of Romans where Paul says, Oh, no man anything except to love one another. Now, what does he mean? He simply means love is a debt you can never repay. It's impossible. That's one of the reasons why we give honor to our father and mother is because they loved us when we could not help ourselves. They, that is a debt that you can never repay. Love no, uh, owe no man anything except love. And so love never gives up on its pursuit of you. Even death cannot defeat the power of love. You and I have both seen it. Individuals that have been married for many years and then their spouse dies and you see them grieve. You see them search for their dead spouse. Why? It's love. Genuine love. It's there. And, and it just will not turn them loose. It will not let them go. That shows it was genuine, that it was very real. So love is as powerful as death. The second statement that is made here in chapter 8 and verse 6 is jealousy, he said, is as cruel as the grave. The Bible talks about God being a jealous God. In other words, he doesn't want any other gods in your life. He wants to be the one and only in your life. It's simply saying love will never give up its rightful possession. That's why people become jealous, jealous. And uh, even God, as I said, is the jealous God because he sees people loving other things instead of loving him. And so this is a statement that is being made, that, that love is that strong, that powerful. It is as unyielding as the grave. It will never give up its claim on you. Wow. That's a powerful statement to be made. Now, the third statement that is made as a description of love, he said, love is like fire. Its flames are the flames of fire. In other words, just like fire continues to burn and to consume, that's the way love does. It never ends. It continues to consume you, uh, to, to take control in your life. That, that's love. It burns it is like fire and he goes on and repeats the statement and says it's a most vehement flame a most vehement flame that's a very interesting word the word vehement here actually it comes from the hebrew word y-a-h-h -H, yah yah of course is an abbreviation of god's name yahweh Yahweh, you see that very uh, continually through the Old Testament. This is the only time you find the abbreviation Y-A-H-H. -H. Other places you find Y-A-H, but not the double H. Vehement flame. What, what is he saying there? He's simply saying, uh, in fact, I, I need to mention that this is the only place in Song of Solomon that God's name is mentioned. 
And it's one of the reasons that some Bible scholars have difficulty with it uh, because even the shortest of all the Psalms mentions God's name at least once. This is the only time it's mentioned. I, I, don't think, I don't have a problem with that at all because it's very obvious. It's saying love is the fire of God. That's what it's saying. It is God's fire, God's flame that is ignited within us. So anytime anyone that truly loves you, I'm not talking about here some kind of infatuation or attraction. I'm talking about genuine love, the kind of love that Jesus displayed for us when he gave his life for us. Anyone that truly loves you, that is a gift from God. See, love is the nature of God. Love is greater than all other virtues. A couple of verses of scripture to prove what I'm saying. In the book of 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, he says, Now abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It's greater than all other virtues. And then in the book of 1 John, the fourth chapter, he talks about God is love. So when we're defining the nature of God, that's the best word to describe him. And he said, love is the fire of Yahweh. It's a vehement flame. He goes on to describe what love can, you, you cannot do with love. Many waters cannot quench love. In other words, you can't put out the fire, nor can the floods drown it. You cannot drown love. It's impossible. The floods cannot do it. The oceans cannot do it. The flame of Yahweh cannot be extinguished. Boy, that, 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 that is a powerful, powerful statement concerning love. This is what they have discovered. Then he gives us the final definition concerning love. If a man for love would give all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. What, what's he saying? He's simply saying, you can't buy love. It's not for sale. It, it, it costs more than you have resources to buy it. It's impossible to buy love. If trying to do so only cheapens it, only prostitutes it. Oh, you can't do it. Love is too valuable. It is too great within our lives. What, what powerful statements that are made here concerning the subject of love. And that's what this song is all about. It's about love. Love that comes from God that now he puts it in our hearts. So when you find true love between husband and wife, that's the flame of Yahweh. When you find true love between a mother and a baby, that is the flame of Yahweh. It comes from God, the God who is love. He's the one that puts that within our heart. And so the, these words here in Song of Solomon, the 8th chapter, verse 6 and verse 7, are a powerful definition of what love is and how it operates within our lives. Now let me go to the third part of this lesson. I want to talk about the chastity of love. The chastity of love. Now, in other words, the virtue, the, the purity of love. Song of, uh, the Shulamites, brothers, break in in the Song of Solomon here in chapter 8 and verse 8. And we know it's them speaking because it's the masculine tense and it's plural. They say, we have a little sister and she has no breast. In other words, she's just a little girl. Her body has not matured. She has not grown up yet. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for? This, again, is Shulamith's brothers that are speaking. Um, I'm not sure all the details. The Bible doesn't give us the background of this. We do know that Shulamith's father is never mentioned in the Song of Solomon. And so because he is never mentioned, we can only assume he is dead. That is the logical conclusion that he is dead and her brothers 
have the responsibility of looking after their sisters. Of course, now Shulamith is married. She is a mature woman. But they have a younger sister, a baby sister. And so that's what they're talking about. They're talking about their responsibility to watch after their baby sister, to look after their sister, to make sure that she's going to be okay until she comes to maturity, that no one is going to take advantage of her. And so these are the words that they are saying about their little sister. If she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Now let me explain what they are saying. I've researched this the very best that I can, and, and so many times these words are confusing to us because not only the culture is different, but also we're talking about something that happened thousands of years ago. So the time has changed. But this is what we believe that they are saying. If she is a wall, or if she is a door. Shulamith's brothers are speaking about their little sister and they're saying, speaking of their intention to protect her and to, they promise to reward her for a pure lifestyle. In other words, it's saying, if she is a wall, a wall is unyielding. A wall is something that it is, is steady and sure. But if she is a door, a door is something that gives way. A door is something that yields. It opens to others. And they're saying, if she's a door, then what we're going to do, we're going to guard her. We're going to protect her from anyone that would try to take advantage of her. Now, I think these are wise words and these are words that fathers ought to take to heart concerning their daughters. This is our responsibility to make sure that our daughters are in good company and that no one is taking advantage of them. It's our responsibility to do that. So they say, if we see that she's a door and she's yielding too quickly and she's yielding to her suitors, and then we're going to guard her. We're going to strengthen her. If she's a wall, what do they mean if she's a wall? In other words, the wall is unyielding. It's not like the door. If she refuses to give up her virtue, if she's a virtuous person, if she refuses to compromise her integrity, then they say, we're going to reward her. We're going to do things to reward her for being such a virtuous person. I believe that is clearly what they are saying. Then Shulamith breaks into the story and says, I am a wall and my breasts are like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who had found peace. Now, what she's saying, I am a wall, she's simply saying, I am a virtuous woman. When she speaks of her breasts, she's simply saying, I'm a mature lady. I'm a mature, virtuous woman. And so she is saying, I'm everything that I want my little sister to become. So this is what we're talking about here with the chastity of this story. God help us, because we live in cultures that many times have been very polluted. And even the word love is, has, has been taken and twisted into something that God never intended for it to be. And so Shulamith and her brothers are testifying and saying, this is the kind of person that you should live if you're going to have a happy life. She ends that statement of saying, I am a mature, virtuous woman by saying, in his, in my husband's eyes, I have found peace, peace. I'm contented. I am at home. I am at rest because in his eyes, I have found peace. Then she makes a statement concerning the early days of their relationship. This is in chapter 8 and verse 11. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. The name Baal Haman literally means 
Lord of the multitude. The Lord of the multitude, that's what it means. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. Now, this seems a little out of place. Why did she insert this at this point into the story? I think it's because she is giving us a hint about how she and Solomon first met. Remember when she said about her brothers, they have made me keep the vineyards and I've been burnt by the sun because I've spent so much hours in the sun looking after the vineyards. The vineyards obviously belong to Solomon. And that's why Solomon has come to northern Israel. It's to look after these vineyards that he owns. He has leased them out to her brothers. And when he comes to check out the vineyards and see how they're doing, how his property is faring, and maybe even to collect some of the lease money, it's there that he meets this beautiful shepherd girl in the vineyard, taking care of her brother's vineyards. I, what, what, a, what a beautiful story. What a beautiful story, a love story. And, and to me, this can be the only reason that she inserts this one verse into the story as we come to its conclusion. Is she's telling us how they first met, where they were. And of course, when she met him, she did not realize that he was the king, that he owned all of this. And so she ends this book by coming back to this cry to know him more. In verse 13, she said, You who dwell in the gardens, there's the word garden again, the companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. Oh my, love never never quits. It never gives up its claims. The fire continues to burn, and obviously it's continuing to burn in her heart, in her life. I want to hear your voice. That's what we're waiting for. She goes on in verse 14 and says, Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of spices. Now, we saw these mountains before, but it was back in chapter 2 when she failed to follow him and she called them then mountains of separation, the mountains of Bether, which literally meant separation. And she's saying, I'm missing you. I, I want to be with you. But now there's no separation. They're together here. And she calls it the mountains of spices. We are together enjoying this wonderful relationship of love. Do you realize what she is saying is not only true in their life, it is true in every married couple's life. I want to hear your voice just one more time. Just one more time. Speak to me. I want to hear your voice. That's the same thing that all of creation is waiting for. This song ends with the maiden saying, I want to hear your voice again. Speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Do you realize this song parallels the Bible? It's a parallel of the same story. The Bible opens up with a wedding. It ends with a wedding. In the middle of it, you find this beautiful love song. It's the story of God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It's the story of greater love hath no man than this, and a man would lay down his life for his friends. That's, that's what it's all about. See, the Bible is the story about God loving people so much, he's searching for a way to redeem them. He loves them so much, he's not willing to let them go. He doesn't even want one of them to perish. Oh, what a beautiful love story that we have. See, the Bible is not a story about God. It's not a story about the devil. It's not a story about heaven or hell. No, it's this parenthesis. It's this break in time that breaks into eternity and 
tells the story of God's great love. And what we discover is there is only one power that is strong enough to redeem sinful people, and that's the power of love. That's what held Jesus to the cross. It was not Roman nails in his hands. No, 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 no. It was love. Love is what held him there. It was love. And so the Bible ends with the same cry that we find in the Song of Solomon when she's saying, make haste, return to me. Be like a deer coming, dancing upon the mountain. Return, let me hear your voice again. That's what John in the book of Revelation the 22nd chapter, and he ends by saying, even so come, Lord Jesus. He's crying the same thing. I want to hear your voice again. Return to us. Return to us. It's a cry of love. That's what God has intended. That's the story of redemption, of a God that so loved the world, he was not willing that any should perish. And so the story ends. We don't know their age, but whatever the age was, as age continues and their hair grows white with the snow of passing winters, intimacy in marriage is built upon virtue. And the couples that have learned that the best, when they come to the end of their life, they say, the old wine is the best wine. The love that we are experiencing now is so much greater than what we had when we were young because it has not gone out. It continues to burn. That's what God wants to do in our life, in our marriages, and in our relationship with Christ. So may God bless you in your intimate journey with Jesus Christ.